Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Larry Bird could have been a poster boy for the 1950s NBA. He wasn't fast, he wasn't sleek, and he couldn't soar far above the rim. But when he assembled all the little, ordinary, outdated pieces of himself and walked onto a basketball court, he was a player for all ages, styles, and colors. Although some Boston fans may have seen him as a white hope, Bird played above race, drawing admiration from every corner of the game. When I played, Larry Bird was the only one I feared. A lot of black guys always ask me, could Larry Bird really play that good? I said, man, Larry Bird was so good, it's, it's frightening. If you put all of us in a room, you know, Magic, Jordan, myself, and Bird, Bird probably be the guy who walks out of the room at the end of the day. Bird. We had a three-point contest at the All-Star break, and Larry walks in and says, I hope all you guys in here are thinking about second place because I'm winning this. Excuse me? And he started shooting, and he just didn't miss. Larry was the originator of getting in your face and talking trash. And then you sit there and you go, I'm just getting up in my face talking noise. He ain't that fast, he's slow. But he knew how to aggravate you, agitate you enough to get you out of your game. I was guarding in my rookie year. He looked at me and he goes, you can't stop me. And I looked at him and I said, gosh, boy, you're, you're so confident. He goes, confident? You're, you're a rookie. You don't know anything. He proceeded to score like 10 straight points on me. The coach took me out the game. He walks by and he's laughing at me. <laughs> Larry Bird catches the ball in the corner. I take off running out at Larry Bird. And right when he's getting ready to shoot, I jump. And as I go by, <laughs> I go by him. He tells me, he says, fly, Bird. And, he, and I go right by him. And he shoots the ball. It's nothing but nylon. Larry Bird was a pain in the neck. Anytime we had a chance to win, Larry Bird changed that. Larry Bird. There was a certain confidence you had because you know if you ever got in trouble, give the ball to Larry and get out of his way, and he delivered. The double team and Bird, Larry, fake, fall away. Hits it the All right. He was a cold-blooded killer. In the last 24 seconds, he would demand the basketball in the huddle. Throws it up. He was a basketball genius. He'd be a step ahead, uh, a thought ahead, uh, play the game like a chess game. Oh, oh, oh. I'd much rather guard Michael Jordan than Larry Bird because you have to play the game as a thinker when you're playing him. You have to get inside his mind. Larry wasn't quick, couldn't jump really high, but there was just some sleepless nights. Bird takes the pop. It's gone. It is gone. Wow. Nice tip to McHale! He had a mind that was like a camera. He had the best hand-eye coordination, maybe, of anybody that ever played basketball. And the rebound to Bird. Look at that, Look at that pass. Oh, what a what shot! A Bravado, backed by a devilish brilliance, helped earn Larry Bird the distinction as the only forward to win three MVP awards. Off the court, he was also less than angelic, playing pranks and telling tales, always at home in the company of bib overalls, cheap cigars, and tap brew. He was a pair in the garage guy in a champagne league. That's where he feels comfortable. I mean, he's, you know, a beer in the garage and a little conversation and tell a couple of stories, and that's a good time. Larry, myself, and Kevin McHale went out one time. I'm trying to drink with Larry, who is a two-fisted drinker. So I drank until I couldn't drink anymore. We went to eat, eat in a restaurant. And I remember feeling bad, and I put my head in the seat, and I said, oh man, I, I need some water. So I drank this big swallow of water, and what Larry had done was like put this whole little mini bottle of vodka in the water, and that just sent me over the edge. And it was just so funny to him that I went outside and I started feeding the animals. Practically the first week we had signed him, I get a phone call at home, 2 o'clock in the morning it seemed like, and uh, you better get over to Burke's Tavern because uh, Larry Bird's there and God knows what's going to happen. And I thought, thinking, that's not such a great neighborhood, I'd better get over there. 
I go over there and he is bellied up to the bar with about 50 people around him. He's wearing a Mack truck cap and overalls. He's just a good old boy. He's having a hell of a time. And all, everybody around him is relating to him. He knew the janitors and the equipment guys, and those were his guys more than the high roller luxury box guys. He doesn't like phonies, stiffs them out right away. He relates to a plumber or an electrician or a cop, you know, because that's what he came from. We had a great dinner, and we said, hey, Larry, you know, give, give a good, good tip. What? All they did was bring it from the, from the kitchen to here? No. Larry goes up, gets up, goes in the back, and gives it the uh, big tip to the cook. <laughs> He's very tight and he doesn't like to spend money. And we're playing blackjack. After a couple hands, Larry, I think, is down like a dollar fifty or something, you know. He leaves. I'm looking, where, where's he going, you know? And he, uh, he's, he's got to quit because he's, he's losing money. He had this kind of inferiority complex. I remember him telling me when we had a long interview about dreaming about money. And it was something he constantly dreamed about. And he would find a huge sum, like a million dollars, under the front steps. I think it related to the fact that the birds were kind of poor white trash, or some people thought they were. So that he always had that to, to sort of rise above. And obviously, like a lot of people who are gifted in that one way, he could do it on the basketball court. On Friday nights, the high school gym in French Lick, Indiana, reverberates with the sounds of teenagers, adults, and entire families. Basketball provides Larry Bird's hometown with its strongest cultural pulse. It's a way of life. The coffee shops, the restaurants, the barber shops, everyone talks basketball. It's what forms community in Indiana. It's cultured basketball. It's rural. It's white kids on farms, doing nothing all day long but shooting jump shots so that they are great pure shooters. It's a kid alone with a very simple basket again and again. I remember Larry telling me how he had waxed the net because the net would last longer that way. Everybody in my, my town had the same things. It seemed like uh, nothing. So all we did was play sports. Born in nearby West Baden in 1956, Bird was raised in French Lick, one of the poorest towns in Indiana. And the Birds were among its poorest families. Larry's father, Joe, bounced from one blue collar position to another. His mother, Georgia, worked two jobs. He grew up in one of the most simplistic ways imaginable. Uh, his family didn't have a phone till he was a teenager. Well, they didn't have a TV for a long time either. The birds routinely moved to different rented house to different rented house, none of which were ever big enough to accommodate everybody, so that the bird brothers would routinely move in with the grandmother for a school year to alleviate the space crunch in the house. Really the essence of Larry to me is his mother who would get up at 3.30 in the morning and go work at a diner in the morning and then come back as the kids were getting ready for school, get them off to school and then trudge off to her next job because they didn't have a car. And Larry talks about his father with a bad ankle coming home from work, taking off his work boots and the ankle swells up to, you know, six times its size. But in the next morning, he's jamming that boot back on and he's going back to work. He loved his father. His father had, was a flawed man. His father was an alcoholic. His father uh, was a laborer who had skills that, were, uh, that he, he could only bring to bear when he was sober enough to work. The weekends weren't fun a lot of times because, you know, you know you're, you're young and your father comes in. My mom always had to get up three or four in the morning or we had to get up, you know, to make sure, you know, he didn't get hurt himself. Among Joe Bird's interior demons were unshakable images from a combat tour in Korea. Joey was through hell in the war. And uh, he saw a lot of buddies killed and he was in foxholes and stuff. You know, and things like that can drain on a guy's mind. And Georgie even said that he'd wake up at night screaming and hollering, get down, get down. 
As Joe's alcoholism advanced, the women in the Bird family assumed greater responsibilities. Grandmother Lizzie often watched over the five sons and one daughter. Long before Joe and Georgia divorced in 1972, Larry had withdrawn into isolation and silence. He was very quiet and shy. Uh, he led by example rather than by words. I saw Larry take an F in an English class because he wouldn't speak in front of his own peers. He felt awkward. He felt poor. He felt scorned. He wasn't handsome. There was the broken home, a feeling of not having the essential elements of solidity in your family that allows you to feel as good as anyone else. He raised himself up and found the one true thing, basketball, that could let him out of what was this tiny island of his own little white ghetto. Well, I was playing one time and there were some growing up standing around and I was playing really well and they were really excited about it. And once I seen the impact I was making, just with a few people standing there, I started playing more and more and started to develop my skills and, and really take my game to another level. After sitting out most of his sophomore season with an ankle injury, the 6'2 bird began a significant spurt of growth, almost five inches over two years. By his senior year, college recruiters were visiting Southern Indiana to see the young gun who was averaging 31 points and 21 rebounds. The hype, the excitement of the local towns going to those games, it was, it, was, it was amazing. You know, we're like, what can he do yet tonight? You know, what's he going to do tonight? In 1974, Bird took his competitive fire to Indiana University. But when he arrived in Bloomington, the deprivations of his home life back in French Lick pulled heavily on his closely held yet highly sensitive emotions. Coming from a town that had around 2,000 and going somewhere where they had over 30,000, right away I sensed that I, I was in the wrong environment. You know, you can just see the two closets in this little dormitory room, and the one kid's got this rack of fine, nice clothes, and Larry Bird's got nothing but a couple of pairs of jeans. I don't think he was really ready to go to school. I mean, I wasn't as attuned to what his needs uh, were as a kid as I should have been. We passed Coach Knight going to a bookstore at IU, and Larry acknowledged, just, you know, so I, I said, hi, Coach Knight, and he just kept walking. And it really hurt Larry's feelings. Plus, I didn't have the funds and the clothing and, and things I, I thought I needed to, uh, to get me through. I made my mind up that I couldn't survive there, and it was time to go. Less than a month later, Bird retreated to French Lick. He enrolled in a nearby junior college, but quit after two days and went to work for the street department. In early February of 1975, Joe Bird delivered on a recurrent threat. He committed suicide at the age of 48. His father cared very much for his family. Certainly there was talk in town that he had trouble taking home that paycheck and he would often stop at the bar and not quite make it home. And he killed himself, Larry believes, and I think most of the family believes, so the family could have the insurance money. They had a lot of financial problems and I think Larry's dad at that point thought they were better off without him than with him. He was crushed that he lost his father. They were very close to their father. Even though he wasn't always there, to see the children and to see Mrs. Bird on that period of time was very difficult. It definitely was a tough year, there's no question about that, but the one thing that I did was uh, make a decision where I was going to make my own decisions from that point on, and if they was good decisions, that's great. If they was bad decisions, I had to live with them. Larry's hard to figure out because he doesn't really show emotions. I'm sure he had a lot of pain, but he just holds it inside. Just six months after his father's death, Bird started a journey toward personal growth and basketball greatness. He enrolled at Indiana State. Larry Bird arrived in Terre Haute knowing he would have to sit out the season due to an NCAA ruling that prohibits transfers from playing. During his scrimmages with head coach Bob King's varsity, however, his talent lit up the gym. He could practice, and our first five couldn't beat him. Coach King said, Larry, I've got to do something to let the first five win once in a while, and they can't win as long as you're in there. And, you know, Larry kind of smirked, and he said, well, just let them take their beating like a man. 
As a sophomore, Bird took charge, averaging 33 points and 13 rebounds as the Sycamores went 25 and 3. But it wasn't until the start of his junior year that the kid from French Lick emerged at the national level. Larry always says the turning point for him was when Sports Illustrated put him on the cover and they had two cheerleaders around him saying, shh, the best kept secret in college basketball. Well, not anymore. Once that came out on the stands from that point on, it seemed like to me the next year was just total chaos. We had reporters from all over the country and uh, it seemed like every day somebody wanted me to do something for him. So from that point on, it was very tough. They quoted him as saying one of his teachers had helped him get ready for a test. She was tutoring him, and they made it look like she gave him the test or gave him the grade and misquoted him, and he loved that teacher. Oh, he was so upset. He told Bob King, if I come back next year, I don't have to talk with the press. Bob said, it's fine with me. The rest of the team, nobody would ask any questions to it, and Larry felt bad about that because he was very team oriented and I think he shut himself off from the media more to build the team and to get the reporters talking to other players. In his junior season the All-American Bird led Indiana State to a 23 and 9 record. Red Auerbach selected him with the sixth pick in the NBA draft. I can remember somebody telling me I was just drafted by the Boston Celtics and I was saying what are you talking about? I had absolutely no clue that they even had a draft that day. I said to Red, I said, Red, why would you draft this guy, Bird, and you know he's not going to play for this season? And he looked at me and he said, do you know how short a period of time a year is? With the Celtics holding his rights for a year, Bird returned to Indiana State as a senior. As the Sycamores went through the 1979 regular season undefeated, the Bird legend grew. He is the pick of the pros, and yes, his fame still grows. Every fan across the land has heard. It's not the Cardinal now. Hey, Larry, take a bow. Indiana has a new state bird. I mean, we'd watched them all year long, coming along, and we kind of thought, you know, well, as soon as they get to the tournament, then we'll find out the real thing. And then somehow they just kept winning. We get to the heat, and he's a good player. Game is over. In the semifinals of the NCAA tournament, Indiana State defeated DePaul 76-74. Then, in television's highest-rated final. Bird led the number one ranked 33-0 Sycamores against Michigan State and his future nemesis. Magic couldn't wait to give you the best smile and say, how are you, make you feel good. Larry Bird would rather say, don't, you don't even say hi to me. I'd rather not get involved with this. I did not like Larry Bird. He didn't like me. Not because, you know, something happened, but because we were both going after the same thing. Overmatched by the larger, more talented Spartans, Indiana State lost 75-64, as Bird was frustrated by a collapsing defense. Committing six turnovers, he shot seven of 21 and scored 19 points to Magic's 24. They'll always be linked, won't they? And that's that's part of the beauty of sports from that 79 NCAA championship. It's pretty hard to you know, say Larry Bird without thinking of Magic Johnson. Winning College Player of the Year, Bird finished his career as the fifth all-time leading scorer in NCAA Division I history. While awaiting the outcome of contract negotiations, he visited Boston. He came to a game, and everybody started standing up clapping, and I'm thinking, like, what in the hell is going on here? This guy didn't even play the game. They don't even know what he's about, but they just think that, you know, he's going to be the difference. June 8th, 1979, Bird officially landed in Boston and signed the NBA's richest rookie contract ever, $3.25 million over five years. Bird, I never dreamed that Larry Bird was that good a defensive player. I never dreamed that Larry Bird was that good a rebounder. And I never dreamed that he was that good a passer. I also didn't know that he would always play hurt. After watching him play, I said, somebody went into a cave in French Lick, Indiana, found this cake of ice, started chipping away, and out popped this prehistoric old-time basketball player. He played like the old-timers played with his head. 
With the 6-9 bird at forward, the Celtics were reborn. Raising their victories from 29 to 61 in a single season, they reached the 1980 Eastern Finals. Bird averaged 21 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 assists to beat Magic for Rookie of the Year honors. Over the next decade, their rivalry would charge the league with new life. When Larry Bird and Magic Johnson entered the NBA in the fall of 1979, the league was in trouble. The finals were not televised in prime time. Part of the reason was image. Now, there were articles during that time, is the NBA too black? I think there were issues, uh, the Knicks had an all-black team. That didn't sit too well with some people. If you ask me then, I would say the NBA would have folded by now. Because in the 70s, you could have bought any team, man. Any of those teams were less than 500,000. Few teams were making money. No major sponsors. Athletically, it turned around uh, when we drafted Larry Bird. Here he came, quote unquote, the savior. So happened, this guy's white. East Boston, South Boston, people could relate to him. And, uh, you know, Larry Bird is a great white hope. The racial component of that was so powerful. Bird was the first great white ball player in a number of years, uh, you know, playing for Boston, a town which had a terrible reputation for race relations going back to the busing crisis of the 70s. White people who have seen black people dominate basketball for so long are heartened to see Larry Bird out there able to compete. Larry gave some people who are maybe more narrow-minded about it a reason to watch the NBA again and feel good about themselves. Here he was out there with a quarter of black guys out there talking trash with him, and the rest of the fellas are sitting there going, hey, the boy bad, what can you say? <laughs> you know, and, and I think what America saw in this guy was somebody who really didn't see race. When I was in the seventh, eighth grade, we always had this basketball court there that a lot of the guys that worked at the hotel would be over there, and they always let me play in their games. They were all black players. Every time I got off that bus, it seemed like they were waiting on me to get there. So. When I started playing basketball, whether it be college or, or pros, I always felt like I fit in. Two people so matched came along at the same time. And of course, there was the black-white thing. And of course, that's what fascinated everybody. And not just the black-white thing, but the white country boy, black city boy. Both of those men brought an unselfishness and a winning attitude and a quality to the league that began to become contagious. We start getting tons and tons of coverage. You know, we went from playing uh, late night on TV to playing prime time. These two guys generate huge television revenues and start the process of resuscitating the NBA from a league that was hemorrhaging money in many cities to a league that could start to garner big contracts from the television networks. If the highly charged court dynamics of Bird and Magic ignited the NBA's resurgence in the early 80s, it was the competitive tradition between their teams that provided the context. The Lakers and the Celtics really didn't like each other. One was seen as a, a low post, grinded out, quote, quote, white team, and the other was seen as a showtime, run it up, quote, quote, black team. And it kept fans attracted to it. It was like Athens and Sparta. You had the absolute glitz capital of the world, and then an intellectual capital, a blue-collar town. It is the old world. And when the two of them clashed, it really felt like I missed out on World War II, so here's the closest thing I'm gonna see. Bird's Celtics and Magic's Lakers met in the finals three times. In their first clash in 1984, Boston trailed two games to one after dropping game three by 33 points. Bird was furious in defeat. Well, we just play like a bunch of women tonight. We got some great players on this team, but we don't have the players with uh, the heart sometimes that we need. Until we get our hearts uh, where they belong, uh, we're in trouble. He knew we were going to respond. Now, guys, let's relax and go out and, and take care of business. And we did. Behind a re-energized Boston team, Bird averaged 28 points and 16 rebounds over the rest of the series, as Boston won the title in seven games. Magic and the Lakers rebounded to beat Bird Celtics in the 1985 and 87 finals. In 37 NBA duels, Magic held a 22-15 edge over Bird. But behind their on-court battles, the two started to let their guards down as early as 1984 at a taping for a Converse sneaker commercial. 
I heard Converse made a pair of bird shoes for last year's MVP. Yep. Well, they made a pair of magic shoes for this year's MVP. Okay, Magic, show me what you got. A lot of people see Magic and they see this big showtime and all this stuff, but uh, I didn't see any of it that day. I seen the real Magic Johnson. In between the takes, we get a chance to talk. And the dialogue is going great, because this is a, really the first time we got a chance to talk to each other. We were just sitting there talking about everything in the world instead of basketball. They couldn't even get us back out on the court to shoot the commercial. Actually, that day, uh, I see him as Irvin Johnson, not Magic Johnson. We're in Los Angeles, and I got a pull hamstring. So I'm not playing tonight. He walks down to me. Man, I'm sorry you're not playing, but I, he said, I'm going to tell you what, since you're here, I'm going to put a show on for you. So you just sit back and watch, okay? And I'm like, man, get out of my face, man. I want to hear that. You know, that's Celtics and the Lakers. Every time he hit one, he look at me. Because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. They're walking hand in hand into history together. And it's no accident that when Magic announced that he had the AIDS virus, the bird broke down and cried, teared up, couldn't talk. To uh, the greatest basketball player ever, but more important, a friend forever. Early in his NBA career, Larry Bird's sense of disconnection from his life in French Lick often was expressed in a guarded response to the press. I was in a, an elevator with him in Phoenix, and I turned to him and said, congratulations on such a good rookie season, Mr. Bird. And he turned away from me. I mean, I scared him. He couldn't deal with someone like me, an outsider who was better dressed, who seemed to represent a world that was threatening to him. But in time, Bird learned to control the presence of reporters. The media begs off with Larry because they're very afraid of him. They're afraid to somehow or another infuriate him. They're afraid to ask the tough questions. He somehow or another uh, has that way of intimidating the media as he intimidated players. He's never said to me at any point in our conversations off the record. And I asked him once about that. I said, well, you know, why don't you ever hold back? Why don't you say off the record to me? He says, I don't care what you write. I don't read it. Bird's unwillingness to back down from the media was an extension of his aggressiveness on the court. Bird fights Kareem, swings the elbow, and now is killing it, Larry Bird. You could never back down. Jaw to jaw. Once you do, uh, people look at you different. You had to stand up for everything you believed in, and, that, and, and even if it's the one playing basketball, I mean, if somebody took the gloves off and wanted to go, you had to go. If you didn't, there's no use playing. Bird's hard nose was never more visible than during a 1984 game with the 76ers when he took issue with Dr. J. Larry was complaining to the refs, and I was complaining to the refs, and the next time down the court, it got in my face. I was up 38 to 6. That's how I summarize it. I don't want to get into the details, but um, I wasn't happy with the way things were going on. Only if you knew that Larry Bird was a world-class taunter and provocateur would you understand what happened next. I felt like he was going to hit me, you know? So my hands went up and his went up, and the next thing I know, we had each other's necks. Larry Bird is no hick, believe me but you could stick straw between his teeth and he could play the role and he could convince a lot of mid-America that he was their boy. How long have you been playing basketball, Larry? Uh, I started two years ago in the United States, so I've probably been playing. Now I'm 22, I've probably played 24 years. 24 years, okay. He's street smart. On the front cover of Sporting News, he wore Adidas. And uh, on another magazine, he wore Converse. Another one, he wore Nike. So he had them all. 
thinking that, hey, we might be able to sign this guy to a shoe contract. Beyond an acute awareness of his own commercial potential, Bird waged psychological warfare at the drop of a ball. The 84 Olympic team is playing an exhibition game against a bunch of pros, including Larry Bird, and they're in the warm-ups. And a ball bounced down from the college end of the court to the pro end. And Michael Jordan went down to chase it. The ball happened to be picked up by Larry Bird. And Michael went up a few feet away from Larry Bird and held out his hands. And Bird took the ball and fired it back down the court over Jordan's head. As if to say, you're not only not getting this ball, I don't give a damn who you are. Larry Bird knows exactly who this guy is and what's going to happen in the next few years. And he wants to get every edge he can get right now. I remember going to Boston Garden for the first time. I couldn't wait to see it, to walk on that floor. And I got there three, three and a half hours before game time. And the lights weren't even on, on the court. But I heard a ball bouncing as I was walking through the court. And look who's here three and a half hours before the game begins, an hour before anyone else would even be in the building other than the popcorn vendor, but Larry Bird. Larry Bird has always been afraid of failing. And what did that make him do? It made him work harder than anybody else. You know, they talk about Larry Bird practicing in the rain. Uh, Larry Bird practicing out by himself uh, all the time, before games, after games. And I think that's the ethic that he brought from that small town environment and the ethic that he has today. Averaging 23 points, 11 rebounds, and 6 assists in his first five seasons, 